All right, night number three, or chapel number three. So we've been talking about let God write your story. What does that look like? We first, I told you a mission story that God's been writing with my family for many years now. And then last night we, we talked about the Great Commission, his story. Tonight is the story continues. Because God, being a faithful author, author, never writes the entire story in one chapter. You know, when my grandfather was killed with his friends in the Amazon, people around the world were saying, what a tragedy. What a waste. How could they have done this? How irresponsible. The tragedy of five young men being killed in the Amazon. But you see, what they didn't realize, they didn't realize that God was writing this story. And when God writes your story, he turns a seeming tragedy into a triumph. That's what God does. I left off um, on Monday, where I'm going to pick up tonight. In 1994, when my great aunt Rachel died of cancer, my dad had gone down for the funeral. And after the funeral, Dawa, who, whose husband, and actually she was on the beach that day, they killed my grandfather. She came to my dad and she said, now that Namal and Rachel is dead, we say that you come and you live with us. My dad said no. And then Dawa said, well, Namal said that you would come. Now, you guys didn't know Aunt Rachel, but you knew better to argue with Aunt Rachel when she was alive. Because she, you were not going to win. She was going to win every time. But they had just put her body in the ground. So how now do you, are you going to win an argument? So my dad used the, what you or I might use in church, a typical North American excuse. He said, I'll pray about it. You know, if somebody here at the school or your pastor back home comes to you and says, hey, where's Kylie? Says, Kylie, her dad's a pastor, so it's all good. Kylie, there's a new ministry we're starting, and you would be the perfect person to head that up. And you don't want to do it. You can't say no, right? Especially when the pastor's your dad. But you can't say no to a pastor, so what do you do? You say, I'll pray about it. Because how, does, how do they know what God tells you? It's a very spiritual way of saying no, I'd rather not. But Dhamma turns to the people, she said, in Yanani. She said, having already spoken to the creator, Wang Ungi, I know that he sees it well. So my dad, thinking quickly on his feet, he said, okay, people, people, in Yanani. Speaking to Wang Ungi, the creator, and speaking to Ongin Kamu. He knew that they could talk to God, but even if there was a way to communicate from the jungles to north central Florida, where my mom was, they didn't speak the same language, so he knew he had them. But Dawa, without missing a beat, evidently Aunt Rachel taught her a few things, said, people, only in Kamu being a Christ follower, if God sees it well, how can she not? So in 1995, two weeks after I graduated high school, we moved to the Amazon. And when we got to the Amazon with the Waodani, we said, okay, so what do you want us to do? Because missionaries do things. If you go up and you're, you talk to people at your church and say, hey, I'm going on a mission trip, will you consider sponsoring me? The first question they're normally going to ask is, what are you going to do? When we asked that to the Waodani, they said, no, we don't. We don't want you to do anything. 
They said foreigners are always coming and they're doing and they're doing for us. They come and they take care of our medical problems. They take care of our dental problems. They will even fly us out if there's an emergency. But they said there's two problems. Problem number one, they only come when it's convenient for them, not when we have a problem. Problem number two, when they come, all they can do is meet a physical need. But our people have a bigger need. They have a spiritual need. So they said, if you will teach us what the foreigners know how to do, we will not only be here when there's a problem, but as we take care of their physical need, we'll tell them how Jesus can fix their heart. You see, as my dad grew up, they had taught him the ways of the jungle, how to hunt and track, how to use a blowgun and how to use a spear. And they just figured, well, foreigners know how to do these things. So my dad, being a foreigner, must know how to do all of these things. But did you hear the, the desperation? Foreigners only come when it's convenient, and all they can do is meet a physical need. But this idea that started in the Amazon led to the creation of ITEC. ITEC stands for the Indigenous Peoples Technology and Education Center. What we do at ITEC, our mission statement is this, equipping indigenous Christ followers for meaningful participation in Christ's Great Commission. But what does that mean? Practically, we equip indigenous Christ followers to meet felt needs in their communities as a door opener to share the gospel. People don't care about what you know until they know that you care. But once they know that you care for them, you can speak truth and they'll listen. So how do we do that? We do that in three ways at ITEC. We develop, we train, and we equip. Develop. We develop tools and training systems, taking things that exist in the developing world and changing them for a developing world context. Now, those are things like a dental chair. If you go to a dentist's office, the dental chair there, which has water, has air, has all these suction, all these different things, it weighs about 300 pounds. If any of you have traveled internationally, you know that you can get 50 pounds in a bag, and that's it. So we developed a portable dental chair that folds up into a backpack that weighs 25 pounds, and it can hold up to a 300-pound patient. In a video that I'm going to show you in just a few moments, you're going to see that at work in several places in Africa. But it's not just rethinking the tools, it's rethinking the training. Boiling the training down to only what is needed for somebody to become proficient in one aspect of, of training. Then we use those redeveloped tools and training to equip indigenous Christ followers. We train them to meet felt needs in their, com in their own communities. Now, I was in Nigeria speaking. We had done a training, and uh, we were, this is back during, just right after the end of COVID, where, but you still had to do COVID tests before you came back into the country. And uh, I told them that I was not going to, I was not going to speak. We were going to, I was going to make sure our team had their COVID test done. Well, they waited for me. And um, Africans, if you've been to an African church, it's lively. They sing, they dance, they, and they can go on for a long, long time. So when I got there, one of the ladies with us was a nurse from Kenya. Her name was Pam or Pamela or what we call her Mama Pam. And Pamela is Kenyan. And so I had asked the Nigerians, I said, who is better to share the gospel in Nigeria, me or you? And they didn't say anything. I said, I said, who is better to share the gospel in Nigeria, me 
or you? And they said, we are. I said, why? And the 800 or so people that were there said, we are Nigerian. Then I brought Mom and Pam up towards the front. I said, you've all we, all we, you've been training with Mom and Pam. Where is she from? They said, Nigeria. She dressed like them. She looked like them. She danced like them. You can tell foreigners, because foreigners don't dance like Africans. And I said, no, you would think that she's from Nigeria. She's from Kenya. But who is better to share the gospel in Kenya or in Nigeria, Pam or me? Well, Pam is. So because people don't know what you care until you know that you care, by training indigenous Christ followers around the world with skills that will meet the people's needs in that community, they then have the opportunity to share the gospel in the hard language of the people who are there. They don't need a translator because they're already there on the ground. They understand the culture. They look like the people. And then we equip others to do the same. And what that looks like is that looks like working with churches here in the U.S. who say, look, we want to have a long-term impact on a short-term trip. Will you help us? Will you walk alongside us and teach us? There's a, uh, a rack card that I showed you. There's some statistics about the Great Commission. And then on the back, there are five principles for a long-term impact, even on a short-term trip. That's what we do. We go to churches and we walk alongside them as they try to figure out how do we train rather than just going and doing something. Now you might ask, so what kind of training is this? We have six major areas of training. Medical, dental, optometry, film, mechanical, and farming. Right now, there's one of our teams over in the Democratic Republic of the Congo doing a dental training. Just so you can get a little idea about what this looks like. Um, I've been a part of many dental trainings. On day one, they teach the anatomy of the teeth, where the nerves run, how many roots each tooth has, what forceps are used to remove what teeth. At the end of the day, they're paired up. They normally come two people from multiple different areas. So two people from this area, two people here, two people here, etc. Eight or 10 people trained at a time. And then they're paired up and they have to both give and receive a shot of anesthetic. Now you guys know what it feels like, most of you anyway, to get your, your uh, mouth numbed. Most of the people that we train have never been to a dentist. In Africa, there's about one million people to every dentist. And so they pair up and they've never given a shot, certainly not in the mouth. And it's at these moments when I look and I see their hands shaking as the dentist is guiding them and pointing where to point, where to put the needle, that it is more blessed to give than to receive. <laughs> On day two, we teach sterilization because we want to make sure if somebody comes in with AIDS or hepatitis, that nobody else gets that. So we teach sterilization technique that would rival what you have in your uh, dentist here in, in the U.S. And then day two in the afternoon, they begin working on real people. Patients from the community who have abscessed or infected teeth, many of whom have teeth that are just right at the gum lines, who are in pain, oftentimes not even being able to eat or drink because of the, the pain that has gone on for weeks and months. And our dentists work very hands-on for about three days. When we start on Monday, normally by Friday, they're just coaching. And on Saturday, the indigenous Christ followers have to start the clinic before we show up. And they finish after we leave. 
The next week, they're on their own. We only certify those who have shown proficiency, normally extracting 20, 30, or more teeth. Soon we have a team going to Kenya, up in the Kasumu region on the north side of Lake Victoria. They'll be doing a small engine repair. In Africa, most of the taxis are actually motorbikes. I've seen six and more adults on one 100 or 110 cc motorbike. But they don't know how to maintain them. They don't know how to fix them when something goes wrong. So our guys teach how to take the whole engine apart, replace the rings, replace the piston, how to lap the valves, and a lot more things that I don't understand. But rather than me going and telling you more, why don't we watch a video that will show you it begins with John Piper sharing the Great Commission. And then it finishes, and you'll see our teams working around the world doing these trainings. Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Oh, how quickly we ride over that. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you to the end of the age. The Great Commission is a daunting task but it was given to all followers of Christ in Matthew 28. While the Western Church is seeing declining participation in cross-cultural missions, we are seeing non-Western churches rise to this task. In fact, the number of non-Western missionaries are increasing by 13% yearly. The Indigenous Church is crossing ethnic boundaries to share the Gospel. In many ways, they are already well equipped for the task because they speak shared languages and don't appear to be outsiders. This shift represents an opportunity for the Western Church to encourage, equip, and partner with the majority world church in this task. At iTech, we want to help Christ followers understand that God has gifted every believer to participate in the Great Commission. Our goal is is to eliminate the potential for dependency by partnering with, training alongside, and learning from the indigenous church. This interdependency is a concept found in passages throughout the Bible and directly in 1 Corinthians 12. At iTech, we focus on three areas, developing tools and training programs for the indigenous church, training national Christ followers and equipping others to do the same, both domestically and abroad. While we cannot accomplish these tasks alone, we rely heavily on God's leading and the guiding of the Holy Spirit, as well as partnerships with like-minded organizations and churches around the world. Headquartered in Florida, ITAC has a core staff of about 20 individuals and a growing group of volunteers. We also have a facility in Shell, Ecuador, with more than 15 Ecuadorian nationals working to advance the mission in their own country. While our team continues to grow, our ultimate goal is to share the mission and vision with church leaders, missionaries, and like-minded people in the United States and around the world. Imagine seeing churches and organizations partnering all over the world, interdependent on each other, and leveraging each other's collective strengths, working together to spread the gospel to the far corners of the earth. This is what we desire to see, and this is why we exist. In March of 2020, we sent a medical team over to, to India. 
They train eight people on basic first aid, triage, hygiene, wound care, and, and several other things. About nine months later, we received a message from those people, the eight that were trained. And they said in the nine months, these are the first nine months of COVID, they were able to treat and share the gospel with 8,000 people. Of those 8,000, 1,264 made professions of faith. 730 were baptized and 27 churches were planted. And do you know what we were doing? We were right here in the U.S. Even had we wanted to go, we couldn't have gone. But the indigenous church was there and they were working. In February of this year, a team came back from Liberia. They had done a medical and a farm training in uh, Zwedru, way out in the, in the frontier area. And there was one of the guys in this ministry that, uh, that we've worked with several times is a discipleship ministry. And as the, the indigenous are being discipled, they have to prove their faithfulness in their Jerusalem, in Zwedru itself. Then once they've proven themselves faithful, they go to the surrounding communities. And then from there, once they've proven themselves faithful there, they go to Samaria, which is uh, the unreached tribes of Liberia. And finally, when they've proven themselves faithful, they go to the uttermost or in their case, West Africa. One of the trainees that was trained in just a week, we got a message three or four days after the training was completed. He had gone back to where he was working in Sierra Leone. And he said he went to a Muslim village, 2,000 Muslims, not a single believer. And he said, would it be okay if I came in and taught you some, some basic first aid and hygiene? And they invited him in. That day, because he knew a skill, 164 people came to know the Lord and were baptized. There was not a single believer in that village until that day. Why? He wasn't the most gifted at sharing the gospel, I'm sure. He wasn't the most skilled medical professional, but he had something that the people needed. Just something. A skill will give people access to people. If you go into an unreached community, they want to know, what are you doing to help us? And that's what this man did. All of this, and there's much more I could tell you, but all of this were because five men and their wives were obedient to God's call. All the way back in 1956. And it's still having an impact around the world today. Not just in Ecuador, but literally around the world. There was a, a meeting of itinerant missionaries in Amsterdam. It was called Billy Graham 2000. And there were about 15,000 itinerant missionaries from around the world that gathered there. And my dad and Minkai were um, asked to participate. They went, they had a 15 or so minutes in front of this group of 15,000. And at the end, one of the people that was with them said, you need to ask this question. How many of you gave your lives to missions because of this story? And my dad didn't want to ask that question, so this man came up and he asked that question, and, and you know, a few hundred people stood up. And then as it was translated into all the different languages that were there, more and more people stood up until two-thirds of the audience, 10,000 people were on their feet, said that they had given their lives to missions because of this story. This is a story not of five super skilled, super amazing guys and their wives. It was five common, ordinary men 
five common ordinary women who are simply willing to say yes. God, you write our story. You do it in your way. Show us enough so that we can be faithful. It has literally had impact around the world. This story is is an interesting story, not because of the men that were in it, but because of the God who wrote it. Tomorrow morning, we're going to talk about your story. So now what do we do with everything that we've heard this week? How does that apply to me? My grandfather isn't well known. My dad isn't well known. I'm not well known. It's this. The God who wrote this story wants to write your story too. And if you allow him to write your story his way, then he is the one that has to make sense of it. He is the one that will turn whatever tragedy that happens in your life into triumph. He is faithful. My dad had a spinal cord injury 11 years ago. And I wrote an article for our newsletter um, commemorating that day. And as I sat down to begin writing, the word that kept coming to my mind is faithful. God is faithful. He is faithful in good times. He is faithful in difficult times. He has been faithful with this story. And he will be faithful if you allow him to write your story too. I challenge you and encourage you to come back tomorrow. Because you're going to be the ha- you're going to have to be the ones that say, "Am I going to continue writing my story, or am I going to allow the Lord, God, the Author, to write my story?" The whole week is titled, "Let God Write Your Story." You have. I would ask you to ask this question tonight: Are you willing to just say yes? God only needs one thing. He needs obedience. Just obey. There is nothing more glamorous, um, whether you're a missionary or whether you're a business person. Neither one is more glamorous than the other. It takes both. One more story, and then, and then we'll close. The chairman of our board went um, with a mission organization when he was very young, got married young, went out and... And they went through training. And his wife, in the middle of the training, said, I don't think this is it. He said, okay. They went back home. He said, I'm going to make a lot of money, and I'm going to give it to missions. And you know what he did? That. He gives to a lot of ministries. He lives in a nice home, but not what he could afford if he chose. When you're a business person or a doctor or a lawyer or a nurse or whatever it is that God calls you to be, if you dedicate your life to the Great Commission right where you are, if you give to those who are going further than you, you have just as much credit going to your account in heaven than they do. God does have a story. I told you on Monday God has a story to write with your life. He doesn't promise that every chapter is going to be easy. In fact, he promises that if you allow him to write your story, there's going to be some very difficult, challenging, hard chapters. But he is faithful and he will make sense of it before the story's over. Let's pray. Father, we are reminded tonight again how faithful you are how willing you are to use not the heroes of the faith, but those who are simply willing to be used, as we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Lord, you are the one that is faithful. Lord, we ask that you would 
tonight as we go back to our dorms or as we go to wherever we're staying, as we have conversations, as we go to the bonfires, we do all these things, that you just, your Holy Spirit would just tell us and just challenge us to let you write our story because you are faithful. We love you, Lord. Thank you for your faithfulness. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed.